All right. Well, hello. I'm Delaware State Representative Paul Bomback, serving the 23rd House District, which includes uh, half of the city of Newark and half the University of Delaware's Newark campus. And I'm joined with my colleague, Representative Cindy Romer. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Um, and we wanted to uh, have this discussion on the current crisis uh, around Gaza and Israel. And so we I uh, reached out to our, our friends at the University of Delaware, and we have two very distinguished uh, 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 professors there. Um, and I'll start uh, with uh, Dr. Kamran Bakari. He's an adjunct faculty at UD, senior director of the Eurasian Security and Prosperity Portfolio at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy, also a national security and foreign policy specialist at the University of Ottawa's Professional Development Institute. Dr. Bakari has served as a Central Asian uh, Asia Studies course coordinator at the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service Institute and has authored several books, including Political Islam in the Age of Democratization. Uh, Dr. Bakari, welcome. Thank you for having me, Paul. Uh, Stuart Kaufman is UD Professor of Political Science and International Relations. He's well versed in issues involving U.S. national security the war in Iraq, U.S. policy, U.S. foreign policy, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Professor Kaufman specializes in ethnic conflict, U.S. national security strategy, and international relations history, has served as the director for Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian affairs for the U.S. National Security Council staff in 1999, and is the author of the book, Modern Hatreds, the Symbolic Politics of Ethnic War. Welcome, Professor Kaufman. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. Um, so uh, I always like to start with the personal side of things. Um, and and Kamran, I'd like to start with you. What are your connections to the Mideast? Do you have family and friends in the region? How are they doing? And how has this crisis affected you emotionally? Uh, Paul, uh, I am, uh, you know, I was born in Pakistan. I guess that's part of the wider Middle East. I have lots of friends in the Middle East, uh, lots of Palestinian friends, lots of Israeli friends. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hearing from both sides, uh, you know, very closely. I'm monitoring the situation from an analytical point of view. Um, I was surprised uh, by uh, the scale of attack. Uh, since 2008, there have been several Israel uh, Hamas or Israel Gaza wars, uh, 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2021. And in between, there have been many clashes involving rocket fire from uh, Hamas and, uh, uh, you know, retaliatory strikes by uh, Israeli fixed wing aircraft. So uh, that was sort of, you know, what we're, we all have been used to. Uh, so uh, when I saw that, uh, you know, you, you had several hundred Palis uh, Hamas gunmen breach the barrier, go into several Israeli townships, uh, kill a whole bunch of people, uh, this was taking, uh, this was very different from what we know is the Hamas tradecraft MO. And so the big question was, well, you know, where did they get this tradecraft and how come Israeli intelligence did not uh, see this coming? Uh, as you know, Israeli intelligence is well known for staying ahead of the curve. Um, I mean, it has even deeply penetrated uh, inside Iran, especially its nuclear program. So it, it came as a shock. And immediately I, I realized that we are now in a very different place. Um, the, the pattern that has existed since uh, Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip unilaterally in 2005 and uh, after two years later, we had Hamas forcibly take over the, the territory after the, uh, the intra-Palestinian civil war. Uh, we were used to, the, you know, these kind of conflagrations where there are attacks by Hamas and then the Israeli strategy is to go in and, uh, you know, degrade capabilities and then pull out. Uh, but when I saw the, the scale, I said, uh, I think that, you know, this time around, uh, the Israelis are going to go for a regime change, in which it does seem like we're headed in that direction uh, a week or eight days later. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kaufman, um, same question as your ties to the region, uh, and how has this affected you personally? Okay, so um, I'll answer that, but, but let me start by saying that, you know, this kind of, I, 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 I'm split brain on this issue. I've got, on the one hand, the academic side of me that, that needs to 
try to be a little bit objective and, and you know, and understand that what where people are coming from now is to react in anger and shock and grief. Um, and that's not a good place to to make good strategy. Um, so part of me is, is struggling to to stay you know objective. Um, but the other part of me um, has cousins in Israel. Um, I've got I've got a whole group of second cousins in Israel. Um, my um, my childhood best friend um, lives on one of the West Bank settlements, um, and um, uh, one of my uh, one of my cousins in Israel, um, uh, you know, posted something kind of you know on Facebook challenging you know her family, saying, "Okay, well, what do you have to say to us now that this is happening?" Um, and so that kind of challenged me to dig deep and really think about how do I feel about this? And you know, the answer is horror uh, and shock. Um, and I mean, Kamran and I are both national security experts. We're both used to analyzing um, you know, warfare. Um, and um, you know, uh, you know, so and again, we're used to doing it at a reserve at a, at a distance. but when you when you let yourself feel what it feels like, um, I just had an email uh, uh, contact from a colleague of mine um, in Israel who mentioned that his brother-in-law was uh, was a soldier on the Gaza Strip border who was injured and is now fighting to you know keep his arm. Um, so I, I think the you know the thing to understand is that for Israel this is a 9/11 moment. Um, this is a, an utter shock, um, an utter horror. I mean, this is a massacre an intentional massacre face to face of over a thousand people, you know, people at, um, at, at a music festival, you know, people just in their homes, you know, gunmen were sent out with orders to kill and they killed. Um, so you know, grief and shock and rage and anger, um, that's, that's what people are feeling. Um, and that's, you know, that's the starting point for understanding. I think Kamran is exactly right. Um, that you know the result of this is going to be yes, um, Israel is going to um, I think certainly um, invade Gaza with the intention of destroying Hamas as an organization, um, and then what happens after that is what I hope we'll have time to talk about because um, you know if is if Israel doesn't have a um, a game plan for for what's next. Um, there's going to be a problem, right? You never want to go into a war without a clear sense of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to get there. Um, that's what I'm, uh, you know, that's that's what I'm worried about. Cindy, you're up. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, you mentioned 9-11, and I, I think about, on the one hand, how our country came together on um, September 12th, but then I also think about how we did not enter September 12th with any sort of restraint. I think it was a much more um, punishing and revenge type of scenario. And I think what we've seen is globally a lot more resentment and anger towards the U.S. And so I wonder with the aggressiveness that Israel is attacking Gaza with, which I do understand, I'm. are you concerned about the impact on fostering that cycle of violence for the next generation of, of people that live in that region. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I'm worried about. Um, I, I think I think that's very well stated. Um, you know, the, un, unfortunately, the United States did not show a lot of wisdom after 9/11. Right? The United States suffered right. this horrific attack, and uh, the second reaction, the first reaction was to was to was to retaliate against Al Qaeda. The second reaction was to invade Iraq, which was a country that had nothing to do with 9/11. Right. Um, so that was that was not wise. Right. And I think most people understand that that was a mistake now. Um, and you're right. It created this huge international backlash. Um, I you know, I, I heard a uh, an interview with former Israeli prime minister Ehud Barak. Um, and I think, you know, that issue is in the forefront of the minds of, of many um, Israelis and including Israeli leaders um, recognizing there's going to be international pressure. Right. There already is international pressure. Um, and it's going to rise. And the more, you know, the longer the fighting goes on and the more civilians who are killed, the more that international pressure is going to rise. Um, so that's a reality that, that has to be dealt with. Um, the hard part is figuring out um, what can Israel do that's actually going to help um, to you know, restore some sense of security. Um, 
uh, and you know that's you know, you know that's that's the part that I, I don't think they've thought through beyond just as you say the kind of the anger about you know you know let's get revenge let's get those people back I think you know the step after that is what they haven't thought through yet. Carmen, go ahead. Yeah, I would just wanted to add to and agree with Stuart. Um, I think that uh, the conundrum that Israel faces right now, that it has an intolerable security threat uh, that needs to be neutralized. How do you do that and you not have civilian casualties or minimize civilian casualties? It's very, very hard. You are already seeing um, the, you know, the, the constraints on the Israeli uh, leadership and particularly the IDF uh, in terms of just their actions so far. Uh, we are now eight days out from the attack. We have not seen a ground offensive. There's a reason for that because it's not easy. Uh, you have seen uh, the move to say, evacuate the northern end of the strip. And the whole strip is 25 by 7.5 miles wide uh, sorry, and uh, you know, length and width. Uh, and if you push, you know, 2.2 million people into half of it, then you create a, a very uncomfortable situation. The Egyptians are already reacting because you know the, the Gaza Strip has a border and a, and a border crossing with the Sinai Peninsula, which is under the control of Egypt. Um, and and you have these. Uh, raids on the part of the IDF going in and trying to figure out where are the hostages to try and retrieve as many as possible. Uh, and, and Hamas, uh, to the extent that, that you know, we, there's no confirmation on it, to the extent that they're true, that have, has said that uh, Israeli efforts to retrieve the hostages and Israeli counterstrikes have already led to the deaths of some of those hostages. So you, it's a very, very difficult situation. And then if you are the Biden administration, uh, you are, you're also feeling the pressure. Uh, on one hand, you are telling uh, the Netanyahu government that, look, we, you have our full support. Uh, we understand that you need to go in and do this, but somehow uh, you need to be able to avoid those casualties. Now, it's easier said than done, but um, at some point, uh, the, I, I guess the Biden administration must have told uh, their Israeli counterparts that, look, uh, if things go south, then we may not be able to continue to support you as we have. Um, the Israelis are saying, look, you know, uh, let's focus on getting the job done here. In the meantime, we already have, we're not, you know, sure whether Iran has the intentions of opening a second front in Lebanon with Hezbollah. Uh, and that's why now you have the administration deciding that, well, the USS Eisenhower is joining the USS Ford so you have two carrier strike groups in the Eastern Mediterranean, as opposed to one rotating the other out, which was the earlier plan. Uh, and so this is a very, very dangerous situation. And there's just no good fix. And I think Stuart is you know, absolutely right. Then what about the day after? You know, let's say it looks like that the Israelis are going to have to reoccupy this trip, because if you are uh, you know, collapsing the Hamas regime, uh, then somebody has to control it. The Egyptians are not going to do that. Um, uh, they, they have enough of their own problems and, and they're scared as to what is to come after this. So it's going to be on the, the Israelis to go in and come up with some form of governing mechanism. And, and, and you know, reminds me of Iraq, uh, you know, the coalition provisional authority first led by uh, General Jay Garner and then Paul Bremer. And everybody knows how that went. The invasion of Iraq, I might want to, I, I want to add, uh, you know, had a lot of unintended consequences that we are still living with and will live with for a long time to come. The empowerment of Iran, the rise of ISIS, uh, the destabilization of the region. So I, you know, again, like the, uh, obviously, it, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, but in this case, Hamas is in Gaza and Hamas pulled off this attack. So how do you not, you know, go in? Because if you if the Israelis just do what they did the last time around, and I'm seeing some of our colleagues publish this, uh, that, hey, you should exercise restraint and just uh, and, and just pull back after 
uh, you know, you, whatever counteroffensive you have to do. Well, that will embolden the other side uh, as it has already done so. And so Iran will look at this, Hamas will look at this and say, okay, so, you know, we weathered this storm. So, you know, let's take it to the next level the next time. So we're, we've been stuck in a causality loop since 2008. Is Israel going to be able to get out of that causality loop? And then what is that cost to the region and to the international community and to Israel itself and innocent Palestinian lives? Do you think understanding the the demographic of um, someone who is within Hamas being um, generally male, do you think that you could see any situation where Egypt would open up their borders for women and children um, just to, uh, you know, address at least the humanitarian crisis. Although what I'm hearing is people don't want to leave because they feel like they're also going to be refugees again, right? So, um, but do you see any opportunity for, for Egypt to do that? Yeah, look, I mean, Egypt has, so Hamas is um, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. And Egypt has the mothership of the, the brotherhood that it has that it overthrew, the Egyptian military overthrew their government in, a decade ago and has you know, managed to suppress the Muslim Brotherhood forcibly. Um, and therefore, the, the Cairo's imperative here is, well, you know, is this going to destabilize us? Because mm -hmm. General Sisi just announced uh, a re-election bid for a third term. Uh, and, you know, he wasn't planning on this happening when he announced that only a few days ago. Uh, and the economy isn't doing well of Egypt. The Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, and, and the United Arab Emirates have pumped in billions, of, tens of billions of dollars uh, into Egypt, uh, and it's barely holding itself together. So the Egyptians are looking at this and saying, we don't want this mess, but at the same time, if we don't open our borders, are we going to have a riot in Cairo, Alexandria, Ismailia, you know, the uh, in other towns in Egypt? The um, you talk about the, the challenge for the IDF. Um, you know, I can't think of a uh, as intense a scale uh, as this where you have the um, the targets being so interspersed with the civilians um, and. I, I don't see how Israel can uh, can meet their goal of addressing the war crime without using tactics that certainly seem to be in the war crime area. Um, I mean, if you're if you're going out of your way to not uh, to protect civilians uh, in Gaza, how can they effectively get Hamas, who are interspersed pretty well with? Uh, with the civilians in, in Gaza? Well, I think it's really important, Paul, to distinguish um, between um, uh, the death of civilians um, and war crimes. Right? The death of civilians is not always a war crime. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the laws of war um, require that the, um, that the attacker um, use discrimination in, um, in who they're shooting at. Right. You know, so, you know, the, the general idea is um, if you're shooting mm -hmm. at a um, uh, at, at a, at a le legitimate military target um, and civilians unintentionally are killed as, as a result of that, that's not a war crime. Right. I mean, it's it's a tragedy, but it's not a war crime. Right. If you're intentionally targeting um, the civilians, that's a war crime. Um, if you uh, if you target, say, you know, one uh, soldier surrounded by a crowd of civilians um, and, you know, drop a large bomb on them. Well, that's a war crime, too, because it's disproportionate. Um, but um, I, I think, uh, you know, I think it's important to make that distinction. Right. You know, Israel is going to try very hard to follow the laws of war. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to avoid civilian casualties. There are going to be a lot of civilian casualties. Um, and in fact, I was just reading that Israel has kind of loosened um, its rules of engagement a little bit. Um, so, you know, you, they're going to be dealing with um, um, Hamas fighters popping up out of underground tunnels all over the place after they move in. Right. So, um, you know, there's going to be 
some people getting shot, you know, spur of the moment, um, unintentionally, right? Um, I mean, to me, the, the really big missed opportunity for, um, for our diplomats um, is, you know, I haven't heard, I, I may be wrong about this, but I haven't heard Israel say what George Bush said in 2001, which was, um, you know, hey, Taliban, you hand over the war criminals and we won't invade, all right? Um, you know, it, Israel and the United States should be saying to the Hamas leadership, um, uh, you know, if, if you want to, you know, it's on you to avoid, you Hamas, to avoid civilian casualties. And the way to do that is to let the hostages go and to surrender yourselves to, to an international tribunal for trial. Um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, they're not going to do it, but I certainly think that that's a way to, um, to kind of make clear um, what, you know, what the Israeli position is anyway, which is that if, you know, if Hamas decides to fight in Gaza City, it's on Hamas that there are going to be a lot of civilian casualties. Um, you know, what the, what the French did, for example, during World War II was they declared Paris an open city, right? Okay, fine, we lost, you know, the Nazis are going to take over, we're not going to fight block to block and, and destroy the city of Paris, right? If Hamas wants to do that, that's on them. But isn't there a, think, oh, sorry. Isn't there a, there's a difference, I think, in World War II France between, you know, the city of Paris, well, I'm sorry, is there, you guys have to help me on this one, between the Palestinian civilians and Hamas, you know what, their last election was 15 years ago or something? You know, this is not a group that really speaks for the average Palestinian, but they are the government for the region. Um, you know, it, it seems quite different uh, from the, the French situation where... No, the only difference is, the, is, you know, Hamas is effectively the government, right? The, the difference is that Hamas is a government that doesn't actually care about its own people. Um, they're they're perfectly happy to use their own people as human shields, um, you know, as and political pawns to to get uh, propaganda points for themselves. You know, the French government, as it was going down in 1940, um, was a responsible government that didn't want to see its people killed, um, you know, uh, for you know for in a pointless cause. I would add to that that Stuart is absolutely right. Uh, look. When Hamas decided to do this, it knew exactly what it was doing. It knew that this scale of an attack is not going to be business as usual in terms of response from the Israelis. The Israelis will come back ferociously. And you know, this time, it's not just mowing the lawn and until the next time, kick the can down the road. This time, they knew that uh, they would, the Israelis would come in and try to destroy Hamas. Uh, at least deny them the, the ability to rule Gaza. Yet they went ahead and did it. Uh, I would actually go even further. They and their Iranian allies uh, actually want this to happen. The more the chaos, the more they are able to exploit. Remember, these are revisionist powers. Uh, and here, you know, this is one of the struggles we were talking about, you know, the personal view versus the analytical view in the beginning of, of, of the session, people are having a hard time. And I mean, I'm not just talking about people who are usually pro-Palestinian. I'm talking about very reasonable people. I know several of them that this thing is weighing so heavily on their psyche that they're having a hard time uh, realizing that this war did not ha have to happen if Hamas did not do this. The occupation is there. It's been going on for decades. That is a problem, the underlying problem. So yes, the Palestinians uh, you know, have been living a miserable life for decades and they've suffered, but the suffering now did not have to happen. So there's the, 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 uh, the, the empathy there is kind of convoluted uh, where you are, you're disregarding what Hamas did and say, hey, you know, but the occupation. Well, the occupation has been existing long before Hamas existed. What Hamas is doing, Hamas is not a legitimate, uh, you know, champion of the right of Palestinians, the justifiable right of the Palestinians to have a state of their own. They are subverting, perverting that cause for their own ideological ambitions, which have nothing to do with Palestinian freedom and independence and dignity, which the Palestinians deserve. And that is a separate issue that has that the international community has not 
been able to make any progress on and because of which we have Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah type actors and even I would add ISIS and AQ uh, to exploit it for their own purposes. So we've allowed this to happen, but we need to separate what's happening right now after the attack uh, of October 7 from the overall situation of the occupation. Um, well, actually, I disagree with that part. Um, I think that when you when you you know, you know when you're talking about kind of you know blame, you have to say yes. There's absolutely no excuse whatsoever for anything that Hamas did. Um, but when you're thinking about you know what's the next step, you know what I was what I was saying about you know you need you know you need the plan for the day after. Um, and uh, Kamran, I think, is right that you know Egypt is not going to step in and and you know provide a provisional uh, you know government for for uh, for Gaza. What that boils down to is the only plausible place that Israel can go um, is to Palestinians in Gaza themselves um, and the um, uh, and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Right. In other words, Israel needs to work with Palestinian people who are not Hamas fanatics um, to try to build um, a, uh, a, a, a government for Gaza um, that will you know, not be controlled by you know, bloodthirsty fanatics. Um, but um, the only way that can work is if Israel also has a political track that reopens negotiations for a resolution of the whole thing. I mean, I think, you know, Kamran's point that, um, uh, that uh, you know, that the occupation has been going on for decades and, um, uh, and you, know, the, the, you know, the life that Palestinian people are living is miserable is really important. And, and you know, we need to remember that that's, that's the underlying reason why all this is going on, right? Um, and, you know, the problem over, the, over the, the decades has been that every time uh, moderates on both sides try to move towards peace, extremists on both sides, people like Hamas on one side, and people like Netanyahu on the other. Um, and, you know, the, you know the, the extreme right wing in Israel, who also carries out, you know, violent attacks, um, uh, you know, get in the way of making peace happen, right? So, I, I, you know, if there's a glimmer of hope here, I think it's the fact that, um, that Israel has formed a national unity government now, um, and that um, overwhelmingly the Israeli people feel that you know, rightly, that Netanyahu is to blame for the security failure in failing to protect Israeli people. So there, there might be an opening for you know Israel to return to saying, look, once this is this fighting is over, let's go back to the peace table. Um, let's go back to trying to figure out you know how to get things on track for um, for something that that looks more like a just peace than anything that's been on the agenda. Um, uh, in in recent years, I mean, I'm not very optimistic that's going to happen. But I, you know, if, you know, if you ask me what should happen, I, I think that's it. Um, let me, um, I'll say, push back or at least explore, uh, Stuart, a, a comment you made when I raised the issue about war crime for war crime. As I understand it, in the past, uh, the IDF would drop a lead something or other on the roof of an apartment building. They were ready to bomb to let the residents know is come and get the heck out of here, you know, if they thought that there was, you know, let's say there was Hamas military equipment there. But I thought this week there was notice from the IDF that, you know, things are moving so fast, we may not have the ability to do that step um, because of the urgency of things. If they were not doing that, and if they were dropping bombs on a residential building, whether there's Hamas within that, if it's known that's a residential building with civilians in it, is that not under the definition of a war crime? And before you answer that, we've also heard that at least some people under the UN um, have indicated that telling a million people to move 10 miles to the south uh, within one day uh, also is uh, within the confines of the definitions of war crimes. Am I uh, misinformed there? Or I, I, the internet has so much information, no, has so much stuff. And I it shouldn't even call it information that uh, it's dangerous. So many claims yes. <laughs> might be the word. Yeah, um, I think on the first one, you're absolutely right. You drop a bomb on an on an apartment building um, that you know has a lot of civilians in it. That's pretty much a war crime. Um, uh, uh, you know, the um, the you know the question of you know warning people to get out. 
Um, I think that is um, more arguable. I mean, I'm sure there are people who genuinely feel that it is. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I can't swear to it. Um, but, you know, you know, for me, I, I use common sense um, and common sense tells me it's better to warn people that you're coming than to not warn people that you're coming. You know, you talked about um, we, we're making a lot of comparisons to 9-11 and what's really interesting about um, where we are uh, with Israel versus the U.S. is um, after on September 12th, there was not this blame of President Bush, right? There was this like uplifting of everything. I think he he ended up, um, I think he at one point had like a 90% approval rating, right? Just because you're tapping into, you know, the hearts of people and where they are um, feeling such devastation. And so I'm wondering, where do you think the average Israeli is? Because we've seen Israel move further and further to the right. And so when Netanyahu has this lower approval rating and people are blaming him for that, are they, do you think there's a possibility they could be blaming him because they think he weren't aggressive enough and let this happen or that these oppressive policies created this situation? Like, where do you think the average um, Israeli is with why they're feeling their, their government is to blame? Like, where do we think we're, we're going to see Israel go from here? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I think the situation is really fluid right now. It kind of could go either way. I, I think the kind of you know middle of the road Israeli voter, or even the kind of you know center right Israeli voter, um, is going to say, "Look, you know, you know, Bibi, you're supposed to be Mr. Security, right? You're supposed to not let this happen." Um, so just at a very basic level, you didn't do it right. Um, uh, you know, those who go a little bit deeper would point out that um, what Netanyahu had done in recent weeks and months, I don't know the exact timeline, was to take troops away from the Gaza border um, and move them into, um, into the West Bank, where Israel is trying to take over more land, essentially, more land that, you know, is basically Palestinian land. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and, you know, so is Israeli, you know, settlers, armed settlers have been rampaging in the West Bank. And then, you know, the Israeli army is being sent in to protect them on their rampages. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's not good security thinking. Right. That is um, ideological, aggressive thinking um, that is not protecting the ordinary Israeli voter. Right. So in other words, I, I you know, I think for you know, the majority of the Israeli public, they're gonna look at this and say, um, Netanyahu has been playing his ideological games. He's been playing his personal games with the, with the, the judicial so-called reforms um, that, that are aimed primarily at getting himself out of you know, criminal uh, prosecution. Um, you know, I, I think the general idea, the, you know, the general feeling is you know, enough BB, right? Um, now, where you go from there, um, is going to depend on, um, you know, who ends up taking, you know, taking the lead moving forward. Um, my, my guess is um, that, um, you know, that it's, it's going to, you know, what's, what's going to end up happening is that the, the least common denominator is going to be challenging the rage. Um, so it's going to be all about, you know, killing as many Hamas people as possible. And, it, you know, if, if ordinary Palestinian civilians get in the way, well, too bad. Unfortunately, I think that's likely where it's going to go. Um, but then that's all going to calm down eventually. Um, and, you know, that's if there's going to be an opening for some kind of move in the direction of peace, that's when it'll be is, is you know, after after things have calmed down a little bit. Um, that's that's the best I can I can guess. Conburn, you wanted to speak? Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to take um, Stuart's point uh, a bit further. So, look, the Israeli domestic political mood, and he, you know, he talked about it, is divided. Um, it has been for quite a while. Uh, the 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 Israeli left or center left um, has been we weakened from the point of view of sort of the Palestinians and the two-state solution because the people on the right or the, the, the forces on the right are saying, well, who do you negotiate with uh, 
the, the, the internationally recognized Palestinian authority led by President Mahmoud Abbas um, is weak. It does not even uh, you know, control the West Bank fully because of internal divisions, corruption. Then, of course, there are settlements, Jewish settlements that are in, in, encroaching upon uh, the Palestinian territory. The current government has been long been talking about and, and, and one has to assume making moves uh, on, on uh, you know, annexation of parts of, of uh, the West Bank. So uh, the, 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 the left, argument of the left that we need to have like a two-state solution for many years has really not gained traction and seen the rise of the right. And, because the, uh, and then Hamas's actions have also reinforced that argument that there can be no peace settlement. Who are you going to make peace with? Uh, Fatah or the PLO or the PA in the West Bank, uh, you know, is doesn't have any influence. Gaza is controlled by Hamas. So who's your negotiating partner? That argument has gained strength. What has also happened is what Stuart mentioned, the, the personal politics of Bibi Netanyahu, where he has moved also uh, in close alignment. I'm not saying ideologically. I mean, I think he's too shrewd to be ideologically far right. Uh, but he, for his own political survival, he's aligned tightly with far right extremist forces on, uh, in, the, in the Israeli uh, political landscape. And that has created a situation where there are further divisions and then the whole controversy over so-called judicial reforms and uh, the, the erosion of democracy, which affected the IDF. You know, the IDF basically came out and a lot of people came out and said, well, you know what, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing this, then, you know, we, we won't show up for duty or whatever. I mean, that whole argument has been going on. That has been distracted. Plus, the West Bank is the real cause of concern for everybody watching this. I mean, I don't mean to say this in a pejorative sense. I mean it analytically. Uh, you know, no life is less than the other or no situation can be sort of compared uh, from a moral point of view. But the, just the sheer scale, uh, scale and scope of the conflict, if God forbid we had a similar situation in the West Bank, uh, where you had, you know, uh, violence radiating out of the West Bank, then you're looking at Jordan destabilizing. You're looking at this spilling into Syria and Iraq. The Iranians are in both countries. They would love for that to happen and to be able to exploit it. And therefore, the Israelis have been uh, focused on the West Bank because you have an 87-year-old geriatric leader who holds all three positions of power, the chairmanship of the PLO, the presidency of the PA and the leadership of his own faction, Fatah. All of that is going to be up for grabs sooner rather than later. And there's already internal divisions. And, and, and the PA has, has a, a you know, very bad reputation amongst Palestinians for being extremely corrupt. And therefore, that's the Israeli focus. And I think that the, one of the drivers behind Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and uh, the Netanyahu government negotiating for some form of agreement was focused on the West Bank, not the Gaza Strip, because there's not much, at least until last Saturday, there wasn't much you could do about it. We didn't have this attack and we were in the old pattern. So I think that the Israeli uh, security forces and the intelligence apparatus was increasingly focused on the West Bank. Uh, it had It fell into this sort of uh, pattern of, oh, you know what, what is the worst can happen? Hamas is going to fire rockets. We've been down that road before. We have a plan to deal with that. Let's focus on the West Bank, coupled with the Israeli political divide. That's why uh, you have people blaming Netanyahu, because all of this, uh, basically, everybody's seen this, that while you were trying to secure yourself personally in a political sense, you were trying to undo democracy in the country. Uh, you took your eye off the ball and that, look what happened. And as Stuart said, you are Mr. Security. So what happened here? What is the relationship with um, Netanyahu and Abbas? Is that, is it, is it, it's not a, like does Israel support um, uh, um, 
Mahmoud Abbas, I mean, he, yeah, like you said, he's, he's approaching 90. Is, is, are they supportive of him being in that role because they feel like they can control him? Or are they looking towards um, forward towards new leadership for, for them? I think the, the starting point for that question, Cindy, is to look, look at that map that Paul's got up for us. Um, the blue areas are the areas that um, are controlled by, um, by the Palestinian Authority. The dark blue completely and the light blue partially controlled. Um, so those are the areas that uh, that Abbas controls. Um, so from Netanyahu's point of view, and and this is exactly the map that that Netanyahu likes, right? He likes the Palestinians um, minding their own affairs where there, there's lots of Palestinians, but leaving the rest of the West Bank wide open for Israel to move in, right? So as long as as Abbas is keeping the situation basically quiet, um, that's very much in Netanyahu's interest. Um, so, um, so, you know, and, and up until now, Netanyahu thought he had a similar deal with Hamas. He thought he had them intimidated to the point that they would sit back and, and do little while this creeping annexation of the West Bank goes on. Um, so, um, so, you know, so, uh, you know, Netanyahu would never admit it, never say a nice thing about Abbas. But as long as Abbas is playing the game that Netanyahu wants him to play, Netanyahu is happy to have him. Happy to have him be corrupt and ineffective too, um, because this means that he can't, you know, really unite the Palestinian people. Um, as long as he's, you know, kind of, uh, you know, willing to be controlled, um, which to a large extent he has been, you know, he's he's uh, he's been doing what Netanyahu wanted. I feel like my next question is, what is the solution to peace in the Middle East? But I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you know, the the territories and the borders of Israel and Palestine have changed so drastically since 1947's partition plan. Um, and while, uh, you know, the Palestinians never agreed with the plan in the first place, there was international agreement that this is what should happen for a two-state solution. So, um but Israel has deviated so extensively from those borders with the expansion of settlements that, you know, the international community has collectively deemed illegal. Um, so how do we get to any sort of peaceful resolution to a two state solution um, that would be attractive to Palestine at all? Like, I mean, I think in the beginning there was probably pressure um, split within Palestine on accepting that two state solution, but now, it's just, I mean, the map essentially, when you know, when you look at that map that shows 1947, 1968, you know what I mean? And then the 2005, it's changed so drastically. So how do you even get the everyday Palestinian to buy into a two-state solution that doesn't at least give them back some of those settlements? And is, do you think there's any opportunity that Israel would, would give back some of those settlements? Yeah, so I'm going to start answering that question from a totally academic standpoint, okay. um, um, and say that um, you know the, the the key to any peace agreement is partial justice. Both sides have to accept the fact that they're that what they consider to be justice for themselves is not going to happen. They're not going to get everything they want. Um, they've got to accept half a loaf if they want peace. Um, so you know, the problem historically between Israel and Palestine is that um, you know both sides have empowered their extremists. You know Hamas is very explicit about they want every inch of Palestine, uh, what they call Palestine, which means every inch of Israel, right? Um, and Netanyahu, as um, I, somebody I forget might have, might have been Paul mentioned, uh, has or you um, has you know allied himself with. The, you know, with the right wingers who take the same position on the Israeli side that you know they want every inch um, except the Gaza Strip which they don't care about um, so you know what has to happen is very simple um, you know I, I you know I, I've spent my life kind of trying to figure this out and one of the places I went was South Africa to find out right well how did they settle the problem of apartheid um, and you know big part of the answer is Nelson Mandela right you had somebody representing the underdog, um, who was willing to put down his gun. Um, and you had F.W. de Klerk on the other side, um, who was willing to give up power in exchange for peace and something that, a little bit like justice, right? Um, so you know, what has to happen is very clear. You need a Palestinian Nelson Mandela 
and you need an Israeli FW declare, and you need them to galvanize the moderates on, on their sides in favor of peace. Um, those are the things that have to happen. Um, the international community could help by doing things like you know, providing some interim administration help for a post-war Gaza um, and things like that. Um, providing um, security guarantees. I mean, you know, there are lots of things that the international community can do to help. But ultimately, it's got to be that the people involved in the conflict want peace and are willing to accept half a loaf. Um, you know, I, I, do I think that's going to happen? Probably not. Um, uh, you know, the the closest we ever came was um, was in 2000 um, at the Camp David negotiations. Um, where, you know, it, what ended up happening was that, um, neither, you know, you know, it was supposed to be a land for peace deal, but ultimately the Palestinians were never really prepared to, to accept a, a final peace. And the Israelis were not, as you pointed out, willing to give up enough of the land. Um, um, and that's even putting aside the problem of the Palestinian refugees in Gaza and in Lebanon who really need someplace to go. Um, so you know, even if you could settle the West Bank, then there's, there's that other aspect of it that's even even you know more dicey. Um, so you know what needs to happen is clear. the The problem is that you know, there aren't enough people who want to make that happen. Actually, Stuart is is spot on. Uh, what needs to happen and what will likely happen, uh, you know, are are two different things. And what needs to happen depends on who's talking. So. You know, there, there is the maximalist position that it, most people want, especially when they're very emotional, uh, and, and which is the case right now. But I think that um, there is sort of, Stuart is right, there, there's a silver lining um, in, in this, in, in that uh, let's assume Hamas isn't going to go away because Hamas exists, although under lock and key, even in the West Bank. Uh, but let's say the Hamas regime ceases to exist after this counteroffensive on the part of the Israelis. Um, that creates an opportunity for that international, uh, you know, internationally supported interim administration. It would be a mistake for the Israelis to try to run it themselves. Uh, they, they, they definitely need to bring the Egyptians. We've talked about how the Egyptians are reluctant. But there's the Saudis, there's the UAE, you know, they have a lot of financial bandwidth to help with this. Uh, the US, the European uh, Union can, can come in and, and support this. I mean, there can be a broader international consensus on this because you see the Chinese for their own purposes uh, talking about, you know, uh, justice for the Palestinians. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, wants to do something uh, in exchange for concessions in Ukraine. So, so there is a role here potentially for everybody to play. Uh, but I think what what the the fundamental problem is that it's kind of like Afghanistan. I mean, if you think about why did the Taliban come to power in nine days, you know, well before the last U.S. forces pulled out, is because the the state that we spent, you know, over a trillion dollars building and 20 years and, you know, four or 5,000 lives, um, didn't have the wherewithal to, to actually stand in its own two feet or to start to fly solo, as they say. And as soon as, you know, the support was withdrawn, uh, it couldn't hold its own. I think the, the issue in the, Palest amongst the, Pal in the Palestinian territories is similar. You have Hamas that cannot be allowed to rule. But you have the West on the West Bank. The other party is weak, corrupt. It has its own leadership transition to go through. It's not there. So the question is, what is which actor is going to be able to, on the part of the Palestinians, do this? I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to be extremely difficult, uh, you know, because Hamas is not going to go quietly into the night. It may lose the government, but it's going to continue to be a problem uh, for the foreseeable future. So you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to try to work with the Palestinian Authority because it's the internationally recognized body. It's very weak, and and so how do you how do you pull this together? Meanwhile, the political divide 
uh, on the Israeli side isn't going away any anytime soon. So uh, Bibi Netanyahu, this may be the end of his political career, uh, but the, I'm sure someone else will replace him as leader of Likud or the you know Israeli right, and they're going to be far right, and that individual is going to lean on the far right people. You you have their opponents. Uh, in a, you know, centrists and people who are left of center uh, in a coalition. So when you have these divisions, when you have incoherence in both political landscape, it becomes very difficult to actually move forward. So this even post Gaza conflict situation, assuming you know Hezbollah doesn't do anything, there's nothing else that you know happens with you know related to Iran. Iran doesn't try to exploit this further, which you know we should not assume. Uh, then still there is this. The road ahead is very tortuous. Can you? Um, I guess one thing is, uh, what is your sense of the view of Hamas by the average Palestinian in Gaza? Are they blaming Hamas for what's occurring now? It's difficult to say. I mean, uh, because we don't have polls, um, it is reasonable to expect that while there are people who are diehard supporters of Hamas, and then there are those who think that given a choice between Hamas and the other, you know, Fatah and the PA, that at least Hamas is standing up for them. They're influenced by that propaganda. And so they're kind of like leaning towards Hamas. But there are still people, enough Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, we hope, who just want a better life, who don't like the conditions under which they live, who are sick and tired of constant warfare uh, just in the last you know, 15 years. They've seen five wars, and this is the worst one that's coming. Uh, and so they, they want reprieve. And so you hope that there are those people, but it's very difficult to say. One of the things I will add is if you see the statements coming from Palestinians in the you know, West Bank and in, in the, the statements coming out of the Arab world and the broader Muslim world and even pro-Palestinian voices in Western countries, uh, you, it, it's kind of frustrating that you, that focus on Hamas isn't there. And there, there are people who are in, in sort of in, in their emotional state, uh, completely either disregarding Hamas or actually being apologists for Hamas. So it's very, very difficult to say where people are. Things have to cool down. It's kind of like, you know, asking the right question in a public opinion survey. If you ask a generic question, you get one answer. Mm -hmm. But if you ask a more nuanced question, you'd be surprised that people will give a very different answer because you've asked something very specific. So in the absence of that, uh, we have a very charged atmosphere and it's very difficult to see uh, what is the truth. I'd like to believe that most Palestinians in the, in, the, in, the, in the Gaza Strip just want an end to their suffering and this constant you know, death and destruction that they've been facing since uh, 2008. I think there are a couple of other elements to this that you, that you have to keep in mind. Um, uh, my favorite book title about this conflict um, uh, is Righteous Victims. Um, the, uh, the people on both sides of the conflict um, feel like they're the victim and the other side is the bad guy. And, the, um, and more to the point that the other side is just evil and nasty and knows, you know, understands nothing but force. Right. And the only way to get through to the other side is to kill a few, enough of them until they get the message. Right. That's the attitude that a lot of people have on both sides. Um, the other thing is that, you know, while Conrad is right, that, you know, you know, these these attitudes are happening at the same time. You know, a lot of people simultaneously just want to have a normal life and feel like the only way they're ever going to get there is to kill enough Israelis. Um, and um, they're angry and scared, um, and that pushes their their attitudes even further in extreme direction right now. But it's but you know I mean for me the most important thing to understand about any any political system and you know you guys are politicians you know this part people people vote and people act politically on the basis of their emotions not on the basis of thinking through things clearly 
All right. Um, and so, you know, you know, when you, you know, for, for most Palestinian, you know, most Arabs on the street, whether Palestinian or, 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 or other, um, you know, their total focus is Israel is bad. Israel is evil. Um, you know, what fought, what, uh, what Hamas did, well, that's justified. That's resistance. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's where the, the, you know, the large majority of, of the, you know, the whole Arab world is and to a large extent, the whole Muslim world is, um, uh, you know, you'll get some people to 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 admit that okay, well, yeah, you know, um, you know, maybe Hamas shouldn't have killed so many civilians, but um, but you know what we've done here in separating out that you know the Palestinians have rights that's one thing, but what Hamas did that's inexcusable and that's something else. Um, that conversation, our conversation, does not reflect what the broader conversation is. Um, you know, in the world as a whole, it's really just about um, you know, uh, you know, people who are pro-Israel saying, you know, uh, ha you know, Hamas is a bunch of murderers, um, and, and, you know, Palestinians who cares, um, without saying so, but that's what they're thinking. Right. And then the other side is saying, you know, the Israelis are just a bunch of murderers. Um, and, uh, you know, Hamas is war crimes again, who cares? Is, is Hamas viewed differently by the West Bank Palestinians as opposed to the Gaza Palestinians? In my experience, you know, at a, at a mosque here in Newark um, was that, you know, even, um, uh, uh, you know, Palestinian Americans um, were strongly inclined to defend Hamas. You know, even when I pointed out the most extreme things that they say, and say, can't you at least distance yourself from that? And they say, you know, their basic answer is no. Hamas is standing up for us. That's all that's really important. Yeah, um, I mean, in in the West Bank, I mean, forty eight hours before this attack, I published a piece uh, trying to explain the diplomacy between Saudi and uh, and and uh, and Israel, and and I focused on the West Bank. I mean, one of the fears is that um, right now there's still a PA there. There is Mahmoud Abbas. There is an arrangement, and and therefore Hamas doesn't have a whole lot of room to rear its head and expand in the West Bank. Um, but that's their goal. I mean, the the they had until this attack. They, if they did nothing, let's say this attack did not happen, Hamas was entrenched for the long haul. Uh, it, Israel, despite several wars. Uh, did not have the you know inclination to go in and do anything beyond mowing the lawn occasionally, uh, periodically. But that the phrase uh, you know mowing the lawn is something that's common with you guys, and I've picked it up. But I think some of our viewers may be un unfamiliar with that phrase. Yeah, basically, it's a it's a it's a military strategy that you 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 can't get rid of an opposing force in a given geography, uh, but you know, you go in from time to time, do operations to keep their capabilities degraded or prevent them from growing bigger. Uh, and so. Hamas Which basically was, just means going in and, and launching, you know, bombing campaigns uh, and, and shelling campaigns every once in a while. Yeah. Um, which, you know, of course, also means that, you know, every time you quote unquote mow the lawn, that means a lot of civilians are dying, too. Exactly. And, and, and that's. And Hamas has benefited from that. So Hamas was entrenched. Hamas has been eyeing the transition, the fast approaching transition because of, you know, the advanced age of President Mahmoud Abbas, uh, you know, as an opportunity to revive itself there and take advantage of the divisions and the corruption within their opponents. And that's what they're that's what they've been eyeing, uh, you know, and that's that's what they that's the prize for them. But I think that the the issue with the with the West, uh, so there is popularity. To answer your question, Paul, there is popularity, but again, we don't know how much because there aren't any you know empirical data that's reliable that can tell us. Uh, and and one can assume that with the growth of Jewish settlements on Palestinian land, with the growing moves towards annexing. Uh, you know, parts of the West Bank on the part of this government, uh, not this current coalition government, but the BB government before the before they formed form the unity government, they that 
Hamas's stock, we have to assume it was rising because if you're Palestinian and you look at the Gaza Strip and you say, well, Hamas has been able to defend its, itself and the Gaza Strip from Israel, uh, whereas our Palestinian authority here is a bunch of old guys who are just, you know, uh, are getting corrupt and they're very elitist. I mean, I've visited the West Bank and it's, it's, it, it was shocking that you have Audi dealerships in Ramallah, which is the capital of the West Bank and the seat of the Palestinian Authority, next door to slums. So it's the stark contrast. You have, you know, elite villas and nice hotels uh, you know, you think you're sitting in Dubai or, or, or somewhere else, but you, you leave that hotel and walk for two minutes and you'll see a slum. You'll see deprivation and poverty. So the Palestinians living there, if, if they're given a choice, they're saying, you know, well, you know, and not to say that Hamas isn't corrupt. It's absolutely, it has its own corruption, but it, what it does overall, it's very nature as a quote unquote resistance movement is very appealing to many people. So we have to assume that Hamas has some traction, significant traction in the West Bank. What do you think would be smart for Israel to do then in the West Bank? Um, because that, that guttural reaction to clamp down harder on the West Bank in fear of, of you know Hamas creating problems there could have that same negative unintended consequence of creating again another cycle of generations of are now feeling oppressed uh, like the citizens of Gaza and therefore maybe wanting to support Hamas instead of um instead of the Palestinian authority I think there's there's an opportunity here that while they will have to figure out a new uh, mechanism for governing Gaza once Hamas has been you know Hamas regime has been removed. Hamas will still be there. Uh, that they actually, you know, focus on the West Bank. I think there's a need for, um, you know, that conversation that was happening between the Saudi Crown Prince and the Israeli government to continue once this dust settles. God knows when it will settle. How long of you know this conflict, this latest conflict and latest conflagration is going to continue? But they need to step in. The United States needs to step in and say, okay, how can we help this Palestinian authority uh, transition beyond Abbas and the old geriatric leadership? How can we bring young people into it? How can we stabilize this? It means compromises on the part of the Israelis. Um, and because of the divide, it's going to be difficult. I mean, I'm reminded of 2005 when a former prime minister, then prime minister, Ariel Sharon, who was such a towering figure, uh, given his you know, history in the military, uh, that even he, as a bona fide hawk, could not easily pull off his unilateral withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. I remember seeing footage of IDF soldiers forcibly struggling with uh, uh, his Jewish settlers and trying to remove them and saying, hey, we're pulling out and you guys need to you know, yeah. vacate this territory. Uh, how do you get, how do you get, you know, Jewish settlements, you know, how do you, how, how do you deal with Jewish settlements in the West Bank? That's going to be an important piece of this puzzle and give up this idea of anne annexation, which is very popular amongst uh, the, the Israeli right, which is very powerful, and uh, you know, uh, right now, uh, especially after the Hamas attack. So I think this is going to be a, a, a multi-stakeholder effort, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, Stuart, do you have something to say there? Um, yeah, I was just thinking that, um, you know, if there's anything good that comes out of what's been going on, one thing might be um, that, you know, clearly um, the Saudis feel under pressure uh, to do something for the Palestinians now. Um, you know, the, the, the deal that they were negotiating with um, with Netanyahu um, was going to be to throw the Palestinians under the bus um, in exchange for um, for uh, security guarantees and, uh, and and arms from the United States. Um, my guess is they're they're now going to feel that they can't get away with that. 
Um, so if, you know, if the, if the Saudis, you know, come in and, you know, kind of renew the pressure on Israel saying, look, you know, uh, you know, you guys, you know, if you want normalization with us, you have to do something for the Palestinians. And that means at a bare minimum, you stop, you know, ex expanding the settlements and you stop moving towards annexation. Um, that at least buys you time um, to start thinking about how to address that, that, that uh, huge problem that Cameron just pointed out, right? Um, you know, Cindy, you asked this question earlier and I didn't answer it, um, but Cameron just did, right? You know, yeah, you know, on the one hand, you have to give back a lot of those settlements. On the other hand, um, the, you know, the, the political difficulty of doing so for any Israeli government is unbelievably high. Um, because, you know, for a lot of people on the Israeli right, the West Bank is the land that God gave to the Jewish people. Um, and they, they think every inch of it is holy. Um, and then you've got hundreds of thousands of just ordinary Israeli citizens who just, this is their home. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the political difficulty of doing that is really, really immense. Um, but, you know, the only way it starts is, uh, you know, one step at a time. So you bring up um, Saudi Arabia, and I hadn't really, I'm not very learned on, on Saudi Arabia's um, influence in that region as far as Israel and um, Palestine. So thinking about how sometimes when America gets involved in things, it's actually very triggering and has like the opposite impact where um, sometimes we're not the the best person because they may reference what happened in Afghanistan, specifically in the Middle East when we get involved. So on that that course, including Saudi Arabia, what other countries do you think should and could have a really good impact on the conversation from the Palestinian and Israeli side? Well, I, I want to add to that, Cindy, that and, and Stuart made a good point that they, I think now the, the Saudis are going to go beyond what the Crown Prince told Fox News that I want some I want to make the, the lives of the Palestinians better. I, I, in order to have a deal, we need to do something for the Palestinians. These are his words. No, he stopped. He didn't say we need a state. Whereas King Abdullah in 2002 uh, declared that, hey, you know, Israel, if you return to the 1967 borders, we promise to normalize relations. You'll have all 22 states that are part of the Arab League recognizing you and, and, and you'll, you know, that'll be the peace settlement. That's a far, that's like, you know, that's a far where, where, where we are right now and the Saudi position is that they gave up on that. They didn't say, hey, pre, that's not a prerequisite anymore. Give something. And I think Stuart is right. They're going to have to demand more now. Why? Because uh, there is a regional rivalry uh, and, and um, I would even say an existential geopolitical situation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Iran is has been you know, making inroads and forays into the Arab world. And the Saudi Arabia hasn't been able to do anything about it. And given what has happened, I think there's a sense of urgency now in Saudi Arabia to uh, deny the Iranians the ability. So they, they've been sort of ignoring largely uh, the Palestinian issue uh, and have not really done anything, at least, you know, at least since 2007 until this negotiation that began. The last time that the, the Saudis negotiated between the Palestinian factions was uh, 2007 when Hamas won the election and there was a coalition government that wasn't working and before the, the intra-Palestinian civil war broke out. So I think now they have an incentive to do that because it's not just doing something for the Palestinians, it's making sure Iran does, isn't able to exploit uh, these situations because Iran is now on Saudi Arabia's southern flank in Yemen with the support for the Houthis. It is entrenched in Iraq, uh, you know, uh, given our war in, uh, you know, from 2003 and, our, and when we toppled Saddam, he's, uh, the, the Assad regime is completely dependent upon the Iranians and, and of course the Russians for its own survival in Syria. Lebanon, you know, Hezbollah is more powerful than the Lebanese armed forces. So it's a much bigger military force. So Iran has its, you know, claws deep into the regional fabric. The Saudis need to do that. And I think they won't be alone. They need the Emiratis. And they, I think the Emiratis are also incentivized to do this. Um, the, the, the Turks have to be brought in. 
And the Turks are kind of tricky in the sense that for the longest time they supported uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and by extension Hamas uh, until fairly recently when they actually uh, you know, basically gave up on that and mended their relations with Egypt, with Saudi, with UAE uh, because their own economic situation is pretty bad and they need financial help from the Gulf rich Arab states. But Turkey is going to be a player in this. Qatar is going to be another player. Why? Because Qatar hosts the senior political bureau or the Politburo of Hamas in Doha. Their leaders live there. And, and, and so the Qatar has to be brought in. Egypt has to be brought in. Jordan. I mean, one of the things about Jordan is for the longest time, at least since 1970, when the PLO was waging war against the state of Israel from Jordanian soil, is that they feel because more than 50% of all Jordanian citizens are of Palestinian background, uh, they fear that, hey, there's no Palestine emerging and we, the Hashemites and our monarchy, uh, we don't want to be you know, the, the de facto Palestine. They don't, we don't wanna lose control. King Abdullah II's father, King Hussein, faced this situation in 1970-71 with the, when the PLO actually started to fight with the monarchy and nearly, you know, uh, caused havoc. Uh, so there, there are interests uh, of Arab states, and I think all of these countries have to be brought in. Um, again, there's an opportunity here. I'm assuming Hamas will no longer be ruling Gaza, uh, you know, once we're on the other side of this counteroffensive, that creates an opportunity. Is it going to be squandered? Uh, I hope not, uh, but I'm not holding my breath to it either. But these players have to come together along with the United States and the European Union. Uh, and then, of course, there's always Russia trying to exploit the situation. Uh, and, of course, the Chinese as well. So can we get some international movement that moves that needle to give some semblance of limited autonomy for the Palestinians until we can work out, you know, uh, you know, something better for the Palestinians. I don't know. Can I um, uh, dig into the the Gaza Strip at right now? Um, if nothing changes in seven days, we're gonna have hundreds of thousands of people dying from starvation. No water, no food, no energy blockade um and then once something is resolved there how are resources getting there how do we assuming that half of gaza city is flattened you know how do we build 100,000 250,000 residences that have been demolished um what who, who steps forward there what, what's done for that the displaced um, well, I, I think uh, you, 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 Paul, you skipped a step, um, which is you know first we have to get through the the horror and the destruction, right? Um, you know, the, you know the next week is going to be probably mostly about really brutal, vicious street fighting. Um, probably the next weeks, I don't know how many, but I, I expect that's going to happen. Um, um, my expectation is that, you know, there are international uh, agencies, there's one UN agency specifically devoted to, you know, to relief for Palestinians. Um, you know, they will, I expect they will work something out to, um, to get um, supplies in um, to, um, to Gaza, you know, through the, um, uh, through this, the site on the Egyptian border. Um, the Israelis will turn the water back on at least. I mean, nobody's going to die of starvation in a week, um, but um, they'll turn, they'll let the water back in, um, and they'll they'll start being you know kind of you know Red Cross food supplies and that kind of thing. Um, so there, I think there will be uh, a flow of humanitarian aid that's going to come in at a sufficient um, scale. Um, well, you know, define sufficient. I don't think too many people are going to die of starvation. Um, okay. I don't probably none. Um, will some people die because of lack of medical supplies? Yes. There, you know, there's not going to be enough medical supplies for everybody. Um, you know, the hospitals will probably end up getting shelled one way or another by somebody. Um, and, you know, people are going to die there. And, and then that means, of course, that the hospitals are going to be out of operation for a while. Um, so, you know, the, the humanitarian situation is going to be a disaster. It's not going to be mass starvation, um, but it is going to be a lot of people dying in the war. Um, once the fighting dies down, 
I think Israel will make sure that that the flow of humanitarian aid um, comes in uh, to you know to get people kind of back on their feet and and kind of restore health services and so on. Um, as far as reconstruction goes, you know, just remember that you know you can't you can't re rebuild anything until there's some basic political order um, to make sure that you know your supplies aren't stolen before you finish using them to build, yeah. um, you know, or that your workmen aren't aren't killed by somebody, um, you know. Uh, so you're um, in ten cities for a year before that's as that's being resolved. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, well, but, you know, well, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, it depends a lot on just how bad the damage is, right? You know, some of the some of the housing is going to be damaged, but not totally destroyed. That'll, you know, be back, uh, you know, being usable more quickly. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I worry more, much more about the, um, you know, about the people who are going to be killed in the actual fighting um, and somewhat less about the humanitarian consequences for the people who who, who aren't. Um, it, you know, you know they'll they'll be kept alive at least until they can get through it. Um, I, that's at least that's 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 my uh, expectation. And, but you know, in the Middle East, things can always go worse than expected. Why do you think we're not really hearing much about the hostages? Like we're hearing about the siege in Gaza, but we're not really hearing. Is it because um, it's it's an actual? Um, military strategy because they don't want people to know what's going on or because everything we're hearing we're very we're not hearing about um i think they were talking on cnn today about you know if it was my child we'd be hearing if it was a, a, re, a different region we'd be hearing about navy seals we'd be hearing about these types of things is do you think that's happening with the the hostage situations or why do you think we're not hearing about it, it, it partly it's because of intelligence uh look, the Israeli intelligence is pretty bad considering that they didn't see this coming. And so now there's a conundrum. This is not just the Israelis. This is any, you know, we faced this same situation on 9-11. Uh, we didn't have, the, there was an intelligence failure that led to 9-11. So, but, the, but the problem is that the government response is dependent upon the same intelligence community and its knowledge. The question is, how much of that can you trust? Not to say that all of it is bad, but then be, there, you know, the questions are raised. What do we, you know, what do we know that's actually accurate? And this is what the Israelis are facing, that uh, we go in, what has Hamas prepared? You have to assume that Hamas, when they decided to pull off such a large scale operation, and they knew that they were going to deal with a major blowback, that they had prepared something. And part of that is how do you keep the hostages? One of the things that the uh, and that emboldened Hamas was the case of uh, a soldier named Gilad Shalit, who was uh, captured in the 2000s. And I believe it was two, three years before he actually was released. And he was only released after a deal whereby I think a thousand Hamas prisoners were let go by the Israelis. Right now, they're, they're including the current leader of Hamas. Oh, wow. Yeah, of course, exactly. And so there were like, now we're looking at 100 to 150 hostages. Let's just put a rough number there. Mm -hmm. They're going to want a whole lot more uh, in return. So they, we have to assume that there's those people, they have a plan for that. So that's why partly you will not hear anything about it. It's hard to get information on them because Hamas has planned it that way. Second of all, the Israeli defense forces have an imperative to not talk about what they're doing to retrieve them because they need the element of secrecy as well. So all you hear is, hey, you know, so-and-so is missing. And then you have loved ones and family members showing pictures. And, and that's all what we hear. We're, we're not hearing any preparation. But you have to assume that, the, uh, Cindy, the Navy SEALs, uh, you know, approach uh, that we we are used to, that the Israelis are working on that. They just haven't gotten to it yet because of the intelligence conundrum. And and to, to be sure that what, because retrieving the hostages uh, had, carries a huge risk in any situation of the, you know, losing them in, you know, that, that they could be killed by the hostage takers or in a, in a gunfight. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm actually much more pessimistic on that one. I don't think Israel has enough commandos um, to launch raids to to um, to free 100, 100 to 150 hostages who probably are not being held all in the same place. Um, and you know, Kamran's certainly right that 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 you know Palestinians have, have thought carefully about where they're going to hold these folks. Um, I mean, I see it as we're not hearing about it because at the moment it's not in the interest of either side to talk about it. Kamran's right on the Israeli side. There's not much they can do about it in the short run. So they don't want to talk about it as long as, you know, the Israeli government feels like it's being held hostage, right? You know, yeah. you know, they they look weak, they look powerless until they actually do something. So they don't want to talk about it. Um, the Palestinians don't, or Hamas doesn't want to talk about it because um, for the moment, um, you know, they, they want to keep the, the focus on, um, you know, uh, on the Palestinian civilians who are dying. Right. That's their that's their ace in the hole um, is, you know, every single Palestinian civilian who's killed is a propaganda point for Hamas. And that's all it is to Hamas is a propaganda point. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not in their interest to, to do anything like that. Um, I mean, what scares me is, um, you know, they're being compared to ISIS and the tactics that they used a week ago. Um, if they continue down the ISIS road, um, I, you know, I'm afraid they're going to start saying, all right, Israel, stop your operation now, or we're going to start to kill hostages. Um, that won't work for them. Um, it will just, you know, you know, cause even more polarization and more anger and, and, and yeah. so on. But that doesn't mean that they won't do it. Um, so, you know, I think for the moment, you know, it's, it's in the interest of neither side to be talking about the hostages, so neither side is. My, my sense is that, and, and correct me if, if uh, you have a different view or if you know that this is wrong, is that the, the intelligence failure was due to Hamas going extremely undigital. And that, um, you know, my sense is that a lot of the hostages are like in these independent cells and there's no list and there certainly isn't anything electronically that tells you where they all are. And, you know, my sense is there's no individual at Hamas who knows where they all are. They just know, well, this person has, you know, knows where four of them are. And, you know, it, it seems to be extremely decentralized um, and that that decentralized planning enabled them to literally stay under the radar. Um, and it, is it not just it? What, what are your senses as far as uh, that element in the both in the assault, but also possibly in how they're operating now? You're absolutely right, Paul. Um, the there are reports now that suggest that the the guys who did the raid, uh, the attack, um, they didn't know what they were training for, um, and that would be part of the tradecraft in order to maintain operational security. All they knew was that they were going to go fight Israel somewhere, uh, but you don't tell anybody. I think it's it's safe to assume that they are sufficiently decentralized. There is someone who is sort of the the manager or sort of you know the director of this entire operation. That person may know, again, and not with too many details, because that person is dependent on independent cells that are have their own sub commanders, and everyone is doing things locally. One of the things in this melee that happens is that. You go in, you bring the hostages, it's chaos. Who's taking who where? Because there's a lot of shouting, screaming, running going on, and you're shoving people into cars, you're taking them. You can't, it's not an orderly thing. So, and then you rightfully point out, Paul, is that you want to stay off the grid, the, you know, the, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and you don't want to send out any electronic footprint because then you can get caught. So that means there's a cost to that, and and then you meet. That means that there are independent cells that are holding the different hostages together, and, uh, in their respective areas. And then, and as Stuart pointed out, it's safe to assume that they're they're in they're spread across the Gaza Strip, uh, and and we know that Hamas has the capability, not a hundred, one hundred and fifty people but a few people they can hold for years. Uh, and, and obviously this situation is different. Now they're, they have to hold these people. There are people who are holding these people while others are getting ready to fight and are already fighting and preparing. 
uh, for the, the, the Israeli counteroffensive. It's a very messy situation, and you don't want to use uh, any electronic equipment to communicate about them. So it's almost like you know uh, the analogy that I would that comes to mind is that the imperative of Bin Laden and the Al Qaeda leadership was to preserve themselves, which meant that they have to they had to it was a trade off that the leadership is secure they're in hiding but then they lose operational control over their organization which is what we found after the raid on Bin Laden's hideout. And, and all the uh, you know the computers and, and, the, and the and the documents that we found that he was out of uh, out of touch with uh, you know his people. I suspect something of a similar situation may be happening uh, uh, because of that imperative to remain below the radar. What resources do you use, which the, the rank and file people can use, so that you can? stay up on this and have less, uh, be less likely to fall for uh, crap in quote information that's out there. Well, I mean, so there, so the, there is, so as an intelligence analyst, um, obviously, you know, there's also a trade craft. It's sort of discipline in terms of, you know, which are trusted sources, you know, when you find a piece of information, that you know what is its likely credibility then you continue to evaluate it um, i would say that uh, social media is a major problem in that respect one of the problems that young people have uh, especially with now with the growth of ai and generative ai in terms of shaping fake news and fake content it's very easy to get lost plus the world uh, has really changed since the advent of the internet, and then in the in the late two thousands, the the advent of social media, the signal to noise ratio is so stark anymore that you everyone in this on this planet, this is a species level problem, where you're bombarded with information, you can't make sense of it. Because um, I remember, you know, there was a time when you had the daily newspaper, the evening news, and Time magazine, and if you wanted more, you had to go to the library and look up encyclopedias, nothing was in real time. Now, media corporations, giant media corporations are struggling because everyone has a phone and an account for a social media and is a, a content producer, is producing news. Mm -hmm. uh, just look at how many podcasts exist out there, how much YouTube content is being generated. I think the challenge, the, the sort of the academic and the challenge for the coming generations is uh, how do we enhance analytical capabilities, skill set? A, how do you inculcate that analytical discipline? And one of the re I would argue that um, even the you know in this case and in general with intelligence agencies is there's they're great at collection. Like we have the National Security Agency, we suck everything like a vacuum that's out there. We have a lot of information. Uh, and AI is going to make it possible that we have more information, but we have more information than we than we can process. So somehow that processing capability is still a human endeavor, and you need to build up. And then I, I am sort of one of the proponents of, you know, bringing back analysis into the public thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you know, this this ideological nonsense that's going on in the cyberspace is just going to get worse. People are shouting at each other. And shouting into the void, you know, as if someone is actually listening to them. Yeah, I would um, I would take one thing Kamran said and, and run with it, which is, you know, if if social media is the problem, the answer is to take control yourself of what your sources are, where you're getting the information from. Um, so for me, I mean, you know, the, the answer is pretty simple. If I want to know um, what you know what the Arab point of view is, you go to someplace like aljazeera.com, which is an English language source that has you know, from an Arab point of view. If I want to know the Israeli point of view, I go to the Jerusalem Post or Haaretz or something like that. Um, so for me, the answer is rely on the mainstream, the, you know, the mainstream media, the, you know, the, the, the old newspapers and news magazines, the Economist, you know, out of England or the Guardian out of England. The Guardian newspaper in England is great. It has amazing details on issues all over the world at a level that the New York Times doesn't touch. Um, 
So you you know so you know, you you go to basically world newspapers. You know something sometimes they'll find good stuff from the Indian newspapers like the you know the Hindustan Times. Um, uh, so um, yeah, you go to the go to the mainstream news sources, plenty of it in English all over the world, and you can find out what you know not what somebody says they think, but what they say they think. Whoever the they is that you're interested in. <laughs> are lawyers and AP News uh, it, it, would they be one level down from the the Guardians um, in, in that um, more global, not biased uh, perspective? I think Reuters is different than AP. AP seems to have weakened over the years. The more Reuters, is still up, Reuters is still up there. It's a wire service that the BBC doesn't depend on them, uh, but. Guardian and other papers depend on the wire service, these agencies. Um, but uh, but yeah, Stuart is right. Uh, BBC is way ahead of the curve than CNN International. Cindy. No, I, I, I agree with you. It's so hard to vet information. I mean, I think one of the things that was coming out is people were sharing images and it, it wasn't even, a, sorry, it wasn't even a, of Gaza, it was, you know, a completely different city, or it was from something that happened, you know, decades ago. So I think it's, you know, I have kids, I have teenagers. And so, you know, we, we do talk a lot about that. One thing I've tried to do too, is to follow, uh, there's a couple like photo journalists that are in, um, in the Middle East and following, you know, you got to be really careful who you follow, but just to see the different perspective, because you know, I think um, I have this little trick I do whenever I do a Google search, I'll type in like Gaza. And if you put the word beautiful after it, you won't just see war torn images. You'll see people who actually live their lives and and have olive trees and are having dinner and are, are living, trying to live their their lives. Um, same thing, you know, you, Israel, beautiful, like just to get a little bit of a different perspective, because while I guess I want to trust mainstream media, it can also be super biased. And so to get a different perspective, um, to Stuart, your point, I'm, I'm going to go back and watch this and write down some of those things you said about the um, Indian newspapers or, um, you know, just finding a different perspective than is just CNN type thing. Um, if we are ready to bring this towards a close, um, Cindy, are you good with that? Yeah, this is I. This has been fantastic. Thank you for your time. So I want to mention um, that, Cameron, you are uh, the key person on a program the University of Delaware is offering on Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, under the uh, the Biden Institute, I believe, um, and history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, uh, anything you, you want to add about the program? No, I think that it'll be a great opportunity uh, for students. So, so I'm teaching this class on Arab-Israeli politics, uh, also known as Middle Eastern geopolitics, uh, but it's a dozen students. And I think that this is an opportunity uh, for the wider student body to come and engage in a discussion. I, I, you know, obviously there's going to be a, a presentation on my behalf but I look forward to engaging people. And I think that, uh, and then students with their questions, um, I, I don't, we can't tell what people are thinking until they, they ask questions. And I think it's, it's important to have a two-way conversation as opposed to just lecturing. So if you're watching this and you can make it there, uh, please do, because uh, what we need is a lot of informed dialogue, disciplined dialogue and, um, you know, let's keep let's keep doing that. I was a little disappointed we didn't have any chairs being thrown at each other. Um, you know, so we, we didn't rise to the normal level of American discourse. Uh, but uh, what, what can we say? Um, it's wrote, virtual. Right? There's no way the chair would make it. <laughs> There's that. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think Cindy would have some technology tools that it would surprise me where she could throw uh, chairs across the uh, across the screen. Um, I, uh, Representative Romer, thank you very much. Uh, I think this, this, we had a joint idea and I think it really has come together well. Uh, Professor Kaufman, um, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Um, and and uh, Dr. Bakari, um, I, I've been so impressed and so pleased that we've uh, connected with you. Uh, I think both Representative Romer and I are looking forward to Tuesday's program. 
Um, thank you all. Any closing words? Nope. Just thanks very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Paul, for, for really pulling this together. It was, it was a really great conversation.